Welcome to this video. My name is John Watts. We're going to talk today about being sued by the National Collegiate Student Loan Trust and about the four options you must know about. We'll also cover a lot of commonly asked questions. So let me give you this legal disclaimer. Uh, we are not here to give you legal advice. We're trying to help you think about your options. Now, we can only give you legal advice. Other attorneys can only give you legal advice after they speak with you and understand exactly what is your situation. And then they can say, well, for you, this is the best thing for you to do. Or these are your odds if you take this approach or that approach. So you'll only get that when you sit down with a licensed Alabama attorney. And I do recommend you do that. Uh, there are folks out there that are not attorneys that will uh, claim to be able to advise you on what to do when you've been sued. I think that's very foolish. Get with a licensed Alabama attorney to find out your options. The purpose of this video is to give you a foundation or a framework to be able to even know what questions to ask. And then also want to make sure that you know there's no representation made that the quality of legal services be performed by my law firm, for example, is greater than the quality of legal services performed by other lawyers. Okay, well, let's get into the actual video here. Uh, what we want to do today is to discover the right answer for you. Now, there may be somebody in a similar situation and the right answer for your neighbor or your cousin or somebody you work with, that may be a different answer than what's right for you. Because you are a unique person, you have a unique set of facts and a unique situation, so you need to find the right answer for you. I'm not going to sugarcoat this or tell you, oh, it's no big deal being sued by a National Collegiate Student Loan Trust. No, it's, it's a big deal. And you're in a bad spot because normally when they sue, they're suing for 30, 50, I've seen as much as $200,000. So it's a very bad spot to be in. But you do have options and you have to take a moment to sort of take a deep breath, Think about your options because panicking or doing nothing is not going to get you out of this problem. You're going to have to put some serious thought into this. And if I can be blunt, you're going to have to put serious effort into this. This may take a lot of effort. It may take a lot of money. Sometimes it takes both. And so if you're watching this video and you say, you know what, I'm not willing to put any effort into this and I'm not willing to spend any money on this, then my suggestion is just shut this video off because you're not going to like what I have to say and it's not going to do you any good. But if you say, you know what, I'm willing to face this problem, I'm willing to invest time, invest money and figure out the best option, then I think that this video will be very helpful to you. So here's what we're going to discover today. We're going to talk about a number of things such as, well, how long do you have to answer your lawsuit? Uh, what about bankruptcy? You're probably getting letters from bankruptcy attorneys. Uh, what about options that you can do on your own? What about options where you hire a lawyer? And then we're going to go through a whole series of questions that we've been asked over the years in dealing with these types of suits. And we'll give you our thoughts on uh, what the correct answer is uh, to each one of those questions. All right, so about a 20-second version of who I am. I'm the one on the left with the red tie. My name is John Watts. Uh, I practice along with my partner, Stan Herring. Uh, we cover the entire state of Alabama. A uh, little bit of personal background. Uh, I'm married. Stan's married. We both have kids. And when we went through law school, and I got married the very last semester of law school. I think Stan was married probably his second year of law school. Uh, we took out student loans. So we're very familiar with student loans and, 
And to go through law school, you have a massive amount of student loans. So we really do understand the idea of, okay, I have this massive amount of student loans. Now what do I do? And particularly in your situation now, you're being sued. I assume you're being sued if you're watching this video. And so that raises all sorts of you know, family dynamics. Maybe your spouse is a co-signer. Maybe your parent is a co-signer. So we understand we have families. We've been in tough spots before. So uh, I hope that uh, you will know that we're not sitting here in an ivory tower saying, you know, I can't believe that you have this. No, we understand what you're going through. And we want to help you develop that foundation or that framework to have an idea of, okay, now what do I do? All right, so what's the biggest danger? Well, the biggest danger is doing nothing. The biggest danger is getting that lawsuit and then ignoring it because you'll get a default judgment. When you get a default judgment, now they can start executing on that judgment. They can garnish your bank accounts. It can garnish your wages if you have property. In the certain circumstances, they can even sell the property, certainly put a lien on the property, but often they can sell the property. And, you know, you may have uh, an aged parent or maybe a grandparent that has co-signed, and they may be looking to you for guidance on what to do here. I thought this loan was paid off. And so if you do nothing, then often they will do nothing. And now they have a judgment against them. So that's the biggest danger facing you right now. And so you want to make sure if you get nothing else out of this video, make sure that you do something. If I can say it this way, don't do nothing. Okay. You want to take action. You want to file a response to that lawsuit within the time limits. And we'll talk about that in a second. But you definitely want to take action because they're kind of counting on you doing nothing. And then that makes it easy because now they can garnish bank accounts, paychecks. And when they garnish your paycheck, it's about 25%, roughly 25% of your take-home pay. So that, for most of us, would be pretty devastating to lose a quarter of our take-home pay. That means you're working one week a month for... The student loan company. Okay, so here's a question that we find is uh, usually at the top of somebody's mind. Uh, is it even possible to beat the student loan lawsuit? Because a lot of stuff you read online will say, well, there's nothing you can do. I mean, you took out the loan and now you're being sued by National Collegiate Student Loan Trust and then it'll say, you know, 2007 trust dash 14 or whatever it may be. And so you took out this loan with bank one or whichever bank it was and you didn't pay it. So obviously you owe National Collegiate Student Loan Trust, blah, blah, blah. Well, maybe, maybe not. It is possible to beat the National Collegiate Student Loan Trust. It is possible that has been done. Now, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying that you snap your fingers and it happens, but it is possible to do that. So keep that in mind. You've been sued. That means you've been accused of something. That does not mean that you're guilty of whatever they're accusing you of, and we're going to talk about this. So there's a difference in owing the debt to somebody or some company and the National Collegiate Student Loan Trust owning the debt. So let's say that you took out uh, $50,000 with Bank One and you never paid it. So, okay, you owe the money to somebody. Well, who'd you take it out from? Bank One. Well, Bank One's not suing you. Instead, it's the National Collegiate Student Loan Trust is suing you. Now, they say, oh, yeah, yeah, we own the debt now. Okay. Well, if they really do, and that was all done properly, then that would be the same as Bank One or whoever you originally borrowed the money from suing you. 
But that's a big assumption. And, you know, it would be like um, you borrowed $1,000 from your best friend at work. And you don't pay it back. And then I sue you. And you say, well, I don't remember ever borrowing money from John Watts. And I go, oh, well, I, I bought that debt from your coworker. Go, okay, well, show me some proof of that. Well, no, I mean, I'm just telling you, I bought it. So you have to believe me because I sued you. And everything a big company puts into a lawsuit is true. Or well, wait a minute. Now, let's see. We've gone through robo-signing. We've gone through uh, all sorts of massive fraud by the banks. And we see this in mortgage companies. And now we have the student loan uh, just crisis that is just now hitting us where there's over a trillion dollars in student loans and the same types of uh, I'll say the same pattern that we find in the mortgage industry where people are making loans and then immediately selling those loans and they go into some type of trust that's exactly what's happening in the world of private student loans and so the question one of the major questions is, does National Collegiate Student Loan Trust own the debt that they're suing you on? If the answer is yes, and that ought to be a pretty easy thing, right? If they really own it, that ought to be very easy for them. Well, if they own it, well, then now the only question is, do you really owe that debt? But if National Collegiate Student Loan Trust does not own your debt, does not own the loan, well, then it really doesn't matter if you paid the loan or didn't pay the loan because you don't owe National Collegiate Student Loan Trust. So just keep that in mind. It's a very important distinction, and it's one that we made a number of years ago, particularly with these debt buyers in the credit card context or medical debt, auto loan debt. And it's equally true in the student loan context when we're talking about a private student loan difference in owing and the company suing you owning the debt. Okay, so here's probably the next most common question. So what is the statute of limitations in Alabama? Well, for private student loans, those are almost all written contracts. And so if Alabama law applies, those are typically going to be six years. There are some reasons why it might be shorter than that. But that's a good rule of thumb to assume it's going to be six years. And then you have to dig into looking at your particular loan documents and your unique situation because it may be different than six years. And the loans may say that the state law from some other state applies. Now, does that include their law and statute of limitations? Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. So it's usually not just a very simple answer to a simple question. Hey, what's statute of limitations on this? But if you'll just, for kind of sake of argument, assume it's six years from when you stop making the payment or otherwise breach the contract. Now, that's important because sometimes in the contract, it'll say you breach or you're in default if you file bankruptcy, if you miss a payment. If you move without telling us your new address. Well, particularly when we're dealing with doctors that have been, uh, you know, residency and other stuff like that, where they're moving around quite often, they may have technically violated the contract even years before they were required to start paying it. And see, the thing is, these student loan companies will hold you to the absolute letter of the law absolute letter of the law, absolute letter of the contract. So if they're doing that, then they certainly can't complain, even though they do, but they shouldn't complain about you holding them to the letter of the law and the letter of the contract. So that's why it's very important to have somebody, either you do it yourself or you have a licensed Alabama attorney, look at your contract, your situation, ask you a number of questions because that statute of limitation may have actually started earlier than you're anticipating. And 
uh, just so we're all on the same page, if the statute of limitations has run, that is a valid defense. Even if you owe the debt, even if National Collegiate Student Loan Trust owns the debt, if they waited too long to sue you, then the case should be dismissed because that is a valid defense. And we have these laws in here because if you imagine a car wreck, which is two years in Alabama, if somebody sues you 20 years after a car wreck, well, you may not have a good memory of it. Witnesses may be gone. So we have said there are certain time periods to sue. And trust me, <laughs> National Collegiate, they file so many lawsuits in Alabama and across the country, but particularly in Alabama, they know what the law is. And if they miss this time period, then that's too bad for them. All right. Uh, I'm going to talk about bankruptcy, but just briefly. You're probably getting all sorts of letters from bankruptcy attorneys saying, oh, we can file bankruptcy, we can take care of this. And it's true, normally if bankruptcy is filed, that will stop the lawsuit. But it's very unusual for bankruptcy to be able to make a student loan, even a private student loan, go away or be discharged. And... So normally what you're doing with bankruptcy is you're just temporarily delaying the lawsuit. And if you file Chapter 13, which is where you make payments into court, sometimes that can be an advantage because it may allow you to uh, structure some payments that are more affordable than being garnished. But even at 13, you're supposed to be paying off your debt, at least the amount that you're behind on. So... Uh, I'm definitely not discouraging you from talking to a bankruptcy attorney, but just understand that it is very, very unlikely that the debt will be discharged. And we get people all the time that call us and say, I can't believe I got sued by National Collegiate. I filed Chapter 7 five years ago and got a discharge order, so this is gone. No, the discharge order says discharge debts that are uh, dischargeable. But a student loan is not dischargeable unless you get a special order from the court. So you can't just kind of do a real quick Chapter 7 and list your student loans and think that they're gone. If you have questions about that, call your bankruptcy attorney and you know really question them on this and say, hey, if, if for example, they told you that your student loans would be discharged and say, I need you to help me take care of this National Collegiate Student Loan Trust case. So for most people, this is not a very good option because it's very damaging to you. And for most people, it gives you very little benefit. So let's talk about four options. And I'm going to break these down into two do-it-yourself options and two hire a lawyer options. So first, the do-it-yourself options. Number one, you can fight this lawsuit on your own. And what I mean by that is you file the answer in court, and when there's a court hearing, you go to the court hearing, you take care of it. When there is discovery, which those are questions that are put to you in writing, uh, if there are depositions where you're questioned under oath verbally in front of a court reporter, and the trial, motions for summary judgment, whatever's happening, you handle that on your own. Now. What's the objective of that? Well, the objective is you want to win. Because if you win, that means you do not owe National Collegiate for whatever they sued you for. And there's some other really good consequences. So that's the objective. Now, the second option is settling your case. But I want to go back to this one before we get into settling. The objective is to win. But if I can be blunt with you, Handling one of these cases in circuit court, which is where the vast majority of these are filed. So look at your paperwork across the top. It'll say in the either circuit court or district court of Jefferson County, Madison County, Shelby County, whatever it is. If you will look at that, it'll tell you, is it circuit or district? If it's district court, you have a much better chance of being successful. If it's circuit court, it's going to be very hard to handle this on your own because there's what's called discovery. We talked about that briefly. 
You're asked all these questions. You've got to follow the rules. And if you act as your own lawyer, then the court will assume that you have the knowledge of a lawyer. And there's something called motion for summary judgment, which we'll talk about later. It's very difficult to do this on your own. Now, am I saying that you should never defend yourself? No. I think it's a whole lot better option than just giving up and doing nothing. Okay? So, and, and sometimes you're in a situation where you say, you know what? I've got time. I don't have any money. I can't settle. I can't hire an attorney. Um, I can't get a legal aid attorney. I've got to do this on my own. Well, then, hey, do it on your own. Because the worst that happens is you get a judgment, which is what's going to happen if you do nothing. So I'm just saying be aware that these types of cases, because of the dollar amount, you know, you may be sued for $100,000. There's a lot of incentive for National Collegiate to really push hard, try to prove their case. And they have a lawyer. They use one law firm in Alabama. And they know what they're doing. So just understand, this is the objective is to win, but there's also, it's going to be challenging to do that. And, but it is a valid option. All right, let's look at the second option. You settle the case on your own. So you don't hire a lawyer. There's no lawyer fee that you have to pay. And basically two ways to do this. You can pay a lump sum. And that's generally the cheapest way to settle these cases. Uh, because National Collegiate, just like any other company, if they're suing for a debt, they want their money. And if you offer to give them a bunch of money at one time, then they're likely to cut you a deal. What's the other option? Well, you agree to payments. It's maybe over 60 months, 80 months, 36 months. You know, 100 months, whatever it is, you agree to make payments. Now, those might be fixed payments. In other words, it's going to be $250 a month or $750 a month. Or it may be that it's what's called a graduated payment. So maybe it's $200 a month for the first year, and then it's $300 for the next two years. And then the next five years, it's $400. And then the next five years after that, it's $900 a month. Whatever it is that you and National Collegiate work out. So what are some advantages? Well, the biggest advantage is you're done. And you haven't had to pay an attorney. The disadvantage is it's going to stay on your credit report. Now, normally National Collegiate itself does not credit report. They usually get what they call their servicer. And we'll talk about these terms a little bit later. And that's normally a company called AES uh, or their debt collector, which is NCO. Normally one of those guys will be reporting on your credit report and it's going to stay on there uh, at least as long as it's allowed to stay. So another disadvantage can be taxes. So let's say you owe $50,000, you pay them $25,000 they may decide that it's appropriate to issue you a 1099 for all or some of that $25,000 that they quote forgave, okay? And then that can be considered income to you that you have to pay taxes on. So you need to think about this when you're making a settlement and make sure that you understand the consequences. Now, I'm not saying that you need to refuse to settle because of taxes because you're not in a 100% tax bracket. But I'm saying that you don't want to make a big payment and go, oh, okay, now I'm done with this. And then in January, you get this really nasty surprise. So you just want to do things kind of with your eyes wide open. All right, what about hiring a lawyer? Well, option number three is you hire a lawyer to fight the case. Now, what's the disadvantage of that? Well, kind of obvious disadvantage is you got to pay a lawyer. And these are not simple or easy cases, so that can be expensive. Now, expensive is kind of a relative term. It depends how much have you been sued for and what type of benefit do you get out of hiring the lawyer? Because the advantage is that the lawyer will know his or her way around 
the courtroom. They'll know what to do when discovery is served or a motion for summary judgment is filed. At least that's what you're hiring them for. If you don't think that they know it better than you, then I guess I would wonder why you're hiring the lawyer. But assuming that you feel like this lawyer knows more than you do about this, and this is what the lawyer does day in and day out, then that's going to be an advantage to you. And so you hire a lawyer if you think the lawyer will give you a greater chance of being successful. Now, whether that means winning the case outright or getting a settlement that is a better settlement than you could get on your own. So that's option number three, hiring a lawyer. Option number four is hiring a lawyer just to settle the case. And you can do that. You can go to a lawyer and say, hey, I just want you to negotiate. I'm not asking you to appear in court, uh, answer discovery. I just want you to negotiate with the lawyer on the other side. And normally all these cases are filed by the collection law firm in Birmingham of Nathan and Nathan. So you may hire a lawyer to do that. Now, the downside, you got to pay the lawyer. The upside is that you certainly hope that you would get a better deal from the lawyer than you would get on your own. And that would more than make up for the cost of hiring the lawyer. Now, my suggestion is, if you're hiring a lawyer in any fashion, make sure you understand what the fee is. Be clear on that. It could be an hourly rate. It could be a flat fee. It could be uh, where it's a certain amount up to this point in the case, and then it'll be... X number of dollars for this next part, and then to try the case will be X number of dollars. All different ways to do it. You just want to make sure that you're clear on it so that there's no uh, unpleasant surprise there. All right. Well, I'll just tell you, when we're hired by clients, and sometimes clients hire us just to try to settle these, and other times clients hire us to fight these cases. And so what we're looking at when we're hired to fight these cases is we typically go to uh, National Collegiate Student Loan Trust and say, look, you've got a choice. We can go to trial. We can go through all the fighting, and that's fine. Or we can settle the case on very favorable terms for our client. Now, we're fine with either way. So we give you, National Collegiate, the choice. What do you want to do? And then they can tell us. And sometimes they say, well, I want to fight. Sometimes they say, well, yeah, let's talk about settling. And, you know, we have a certain amount of authority from our client, whether that's actually paying money. Sometimes it's not paying money. When we go up to these, you know, these collection type suits and we say to the person that sued our client, we're not going to pay you any money. And you're going to get off of our credit report and you're going to go away. And sometimes that's the choice we give them. So it all depends on what is your situation, what are your unique facts that you're dealing with. Okay, here's probably the question that's going through your mind. Okay, great. You know, I understand there's that extreme option of bankruptcy, and, you know, maybe that would work. And if you're interested in that, go talk with a bankruptcy lawyer. Uh, but putting that aside, you say, okay, I got these four options. I can fight it on my own, settle it on my own, hire a lawyer, fight, hire a lawyer, settle it. Which one's best for me? Honestly, I don't know because I don't know what your situation is. I can give you some guidelines. You need to think about, you know, how much time do you have? Do you have time to handle this on your own? How confident are you in dealing with the collection lawyers on your own? Uh, do you have money to hire a lawyer? Do you have money to pay a judgment if you lose the case? Do you have money to settle the case? Do you have a lump sum that you could use to settle the case? Uh, is it just you that has been sued? Or did they sue your ex-wife? Did they sue your mother, your grandfather? Did they sue somebody else? So there's all these different factors that it's not an easy choice to decide, oh yeah, I'm, I'm definitely fighting this on my own, or I'm definitely settling, or definitely hiring a lawyer. You really have to kind of get in there and dig 
and, and figure out the best option for you. And that's one reason why we've done this video. We want to give you a nice overview. And then if you're interested in talking with me, my law firm is Watson Herring. Our phone number is 205-879-2447. Just ask to speak to Carolyn. She'll gather your information, pull the court file uh, online, and then set up a phone call between the two of us. And we'll talk about this. And we'll go over your options. But I won't have to spend time sort of explaining all the stuff I do in this video. Instead, we can just jump right into Okay, tell me exactly what's happened. Let me look at the documents. Now let's figure out what's the best option for you. Well, one thing that will help you know what the best option is, I think, is to go through these very common questions we get. And not all of these will apply to you, but I bet some of these you'll say, oh yeah, that I had that one in my mind. So here's first one. Normally it's Nathan and Nathan. There are some other people that sue, but they're the predominant firm. Uh, if I talk to Nathan and Nathan about settling, does that mean I admit I owe the debt? It's a very common question. And the answer is no. Now, if you talk to them and say, I admit that I owe National Collegiate Student Loan Trust the debt, then that may be a problem. But the general rule is that when we talk with the other side about settling, that is confidential. That does not come out in trial. And the reason is, if whenever two parties in a lawsuit, I don't care if it's a collection case or Ford is suing IBM or Apple and Samsung, whoever it is, if when those guys talk about settling, if that could come up in trial, then nobody would talk about settling. So that's why we have this rule. It's called a rule of evidence that settlement discussions do not come up in trial. So uh, I, I would caution you to really think carefully when you talk with Nathan, Nathan, do you want to admit that you owe National Collegiate Student Loan Trust because how in the world would you know if they really own your debt? Because I'm assuming, unless your loan is different than every other loan in the nation that they have, they did not make the loan to you. Okay. It was some other bank, and then supposedly that bank sold it to one or more people, and one of which may be National Collegiate Student Loan Trust, but that's something they have to prove, and, and they guard those purchase agreements, those contracts, like they're the formula to Coke or KFC. So I don't know how you would know that you really owe the debt to National Collegiate Student Loan Trust. But you can talk to them and try to work something out, and that does not mean that you've lost your case just by talking to them. One final word on this, and then we'll go to the next question. While you're talking to them, you need to make sure that you file an answer because you don't want them to do a default judgment on you. Okay, so what's a judgment? See, if you don't file an answer, they may get a default judgment. And you may hear things like consent judgment or summary judgment. Well, a judgment is where the court says somebody has won and somebody has lost. And that is the, we might say, the final order from the court. And that decides the issue. So if there's a default judgment, that means you defaulted, you didn't show up, and the other side won. And that is a valid judgment that leads to garnishment. For some reason, there's stuff on the internet about, well, default judgment really is no good. No, it's perfectly valid. And it's a real judgment. Another real judgment is a consent judgment. And so normally, if you talk to National Collegiate and you say, look, I need to do a payment plan, they'll say, okay, great. Uh, we just need to get a consent judgment and then we can do that. So what's a consent judgment? Oh, well, it's just where we agree to a judgment, and as long as you make your payments like you agree, we won't do anything to you. We won't collect on this judgment. Like, okay, well, that seems pretty good. Well, it may be all right for you. I'm just telling you, generally, that's a bad idea, at least for my clients. It's very rare that I've ever had a client agree to a consent judgment because a consent judgment is a judgment shows up on your credit report 
and you have to if you're applying for a loan and it has a box that says do you have a judgment against you you gotta say yep i got a judgment and like i said it's on your credit report stays on there for years and years and years so i think normally that is not a good idea at least for my clients i think it's a bad idea so and if you are thinking about doing it just make sure you understand what a consent judgment is and if the collection lawyers are talking to you about a consent judgment, ask them. Say, okay, what exactly does this mean? If you've been sued, you may get a letter from, and there are different firms, but one is uh, Ferry and Nichols or Nichols and Ferry or something like that. Uh, and they say, hey, we're a mediation company. We'll help negotiate a settlement. And normally, this letter gets sent out the day after you've been sued. Now, you should not get any advertisement letters from a lawyer until after seven days of being served. So you get served on May the 1st. You shouldn't get a letter till you know May the 8th or 9th, something like that, from a lawyer. But these mediation companies say, well, we're not lawyers, so we're not subject to the ethical rules. And the so question is, should you hire one of those companies? Well, you can certainly do whatever it is that you feel is best. I'll tell you, in my experience, uh, at least the people I talk to, that does not end well. And that is to be expected, in my opinion, because you've been sued maybe for $50,000, $100,000. That's a pretty serious matter. And now you have a, a uh, company that's not... A law firm saying hey we're gonna help you with this well they can't file an answer for you in court they can't show up in court for you and I see a lot of situations where people hire these companies and they think it's all being handled then they get a default judgment against them and then the company goes oh well hey we're not lawyers we can't help you sorry about that hey we're we're pulling for you on that one good luck so I'm not sure that that would be a very smart move. But again, if you decide to go that route, just make sure you understand what you're getting yourself into. Well, here's a question. Do debt collectors even have a right to sue me? Um, you know, there's a lot of thought out there. I have some videos on YouTube and a lot of comments. People saying, oh, it's absolutely illegal to buy a debt. You can only be sued by the original creditor. So if you took out your loan with Bank One, or Chase, or whoever it is, then it's illegal for National Collegiate Student Loan Trust to sue you and to buy the debt. Well, in Alabama, unless I'm just horribly mistaken on the law, and I you know, have some experience in this area, and I teach in this area, uh, you can buy debt in Alabama. Now, the question is, did the company that sued you really buy the debt? Now, that's a completely separate question than, is it inherently right or wrong to buy debt. No, you can buy debt in Alabama, but the company that buys the debt better be able to prove that when they sue you, and particularly when it's, it's changed hands a number of times. So yes, they can buy debt, they can sue you on old debt. So the question is, is National Collegiate a debt collector or a debt buyer? And that's a very interesting question. Basically, here's the idea. If a company buys a debt and they complete the purchase of that while the debt is in good standing, then normally that company will not be considered a quote debt collector or a debt buyer. But if a company buys a debt and that debt is in default when they buy it, then normally that company will be considered a debt collector or a debt buyer. And this is particularly true under the FDCPA, the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. So let me give you a couple examples. You could have a collection agency, but they get a debt before it's in default. Well, even though that's a, quote, collection agency, it may not be considered a, quote, debt collector because they got the loan when it was still in good standing. Well, what about your mortgage company? You know, you got Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Chase. It's like, well, obviously those guys aren't debt collectors. Well, I don't know. 
they may have received the debt because these mortgages are bought and sold and we have servicers those are the people that collect the money and make sure you have insurance that type of thing sometimes they get the debt the loan the home mortgage when it's technically in default and that normally makes them a debt collector so go back to national collegiate when do they get the debt do they get it before you defaulted or after you defaulted that's going to be the critical question now they always say oh we got it like you know instantaneous as soon as you got the loan from blank bank then we got it and and there is a very convoluted structure to the banks and there's this company called Marblehead and there's National Collegiate Student Loan Trust and there's AES and NCO and it's this kind of incestuous complicated web here but that's what they'll say like oh yeah we, we bought it immediately okay maybe you did maybe you didn't that's something that when National Collegiate proves you or when they see you they got to prove to you prove to the court that they really bought the debt. So they may or may not be a debt collector or a debt buyer. All right, well, this goes to really that first option. If I file my own answer, where do I take it? Well, you take it to the court where you were sued. Take it to the clerk of the court. So if you're sued in district court, you take it to a district court clerk. If, as is almost always the case, if you're sued in circuit court, take it to the circuit court clerk. And my suggestion is, unless you have plenty of time uh, to get your answer in, you take it there in person and take you a couple of copies because you want to send one to the collection lawyer and you can just send it by mail. But then you want a copy that you can get stamped file. They'll stick it in a little machine. It'll say this was filed on you know, May the 15th at 2.33 p.m. And that's your proof that you filed your answer. And so I think that's a very valuable thing to have. And you take it there rather than mailing it to the court because what if it gets lost in the mail? Or what if it doesn't get processed quickly? I just think the safest thing, take it in person. It doesn't have to be you. It could be somebody else. But have that person take it there, personally file it, and get that stamp copy back. All right, well, what if I'm in trial and National Collegiate brings a witness? Well, here's the thing. If you're handling this on your own, then you have to know how to cross-examine a witness. You have to know how to object to evidence. And that's going to be a difficult matter. Uh, you know, there are thousands of lawyers out there. Uh, not all lawyers know how to do courtroom work. Not all lawyers know how to object to evidence properly or what the requirements are to prove a case. So, you know, it's only kind of a subset of lawyers that are really uh, experienced in a courtroom. And so not only are you not a lawyer, unless you are a lawyer, uh, so I'm going to assume you're not a lawyer, you've got to learn the law, and this may be your first time actually trying a case in circuit court. So, you know, that, I don't know exactly what else to say other than you just have to know what questions to ask what objections to make, because uh, if you're representing yourself, you have to be your own attorney. All right, you may have read, because it's a very common tactic, National Collegiate will file a motion for summary judgment. A motion is simply a request. Now, we don't ask judges unless we're in the courtroom. Uh, we don't ask them to do something verbally. We don't call them on the phone uh, or you know anything like that instead we ask it in writing that's called a motion and summary judgment is saying to the court judge there's you don't need a trial the facts are obvious here and I'll even give my opponent the benefit of the doubt and if you look at those facts and you look at the law it's clear the only reasonable result anybody could make is to rule in my favor so you could file that motion, and National Collegiate could file that motion. And normally National Collegiate does. <clears throat> One of the reasons is they can get affidavits from all these different companies that are involved. And if they can win the summary judgment, then there's no trial. 
And this confuses a lot of people. They say, no, 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 no. I want my day in court. Well, the summary judgment was your day in court. And if National Collegiate can win on summary judgment, then they don't have to fly in all these witnesses from around the country. They just get affidavits from them. Affidavit's a sworn statement. And so that's what a motion for summary judgment is. We'll talk a little bit more about responding to it, but just the, the answer to this question is yes, they normally will file a motion, and now you have an overview of what that is. All right, well, here's one that comes up some. Say, you know, I'm pretty sure the debt was charged off. I, I saw my credit report, it was charged off, so I can't be sued. So I don't need to do anything with this National Collegiate lawsuit. Well, this is where we start confusing some concepts. So a charge off normally is an accounting function. And it just says, if you go a certain period of time, normally it's about six months without being paid when you're supposed to be paid, then you cannot show that as a receivable, as an accounts receivable. Because that would kind of make your books, when I say you, I mean the company that's supposedly owed the money, it make your books inaccurate. Because it looks like you got all these assets. Hey, I got all these accounts receivable, but really it's starting to become unlikely you're going to get paid. So this is really an accounting function where they say, okay, well, we're going to take that off accounts receivable, that has nothing to do with whether the debt is owed. And it can say on your credit report charge off, that has nothing to do with whether the debt is owed. So you can be sued on something that's been charged off. So it, it's kind of like confusing the statute of limitations with the period of time somebody can credit report. Those are two completely separate things. Well, again, charge off and legally being obligated on the debt are two separate items. This is one that I hear in the student loan context. Uh, I heard judges won't allow collection lawyers to actually get judgments against consumers, so I'm not worried about this. Well, you may have heard that. I don't know where you heard it, but I strongly suggest that whoever you heard that from doesn't know what they're talking about in Alabama because Alabama judges will follow the law. And if the law is that you lose, maybe you default, maybe you do a consent judgment, maybe you don't properly answer the summary judgment because you don't know the rules, or you go to trial and you lose, they will put a judgment against you. They're not going to say, oh, it's a collection case, this is a consumer, I'm not going to... No, they don't do that. They're going to just follow the law. All right, sometimes people ask us this because we often... I tell people before we talk, pull your credit reports. So why do I have to pull my credit reports? Well, it can give us information about these student loans. And I'll give you an example. What if you took out a student loan in 2005 and your memory is that the last time you made a payment was to January of 2009. And you've been sued May 2015. Well, that would tend to make us think we probably have a pretty good statute of limitation defense, right? January 2009, they should have sued January 2015. But they sued in May 2015. But they say, oh, no, 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 your last payment was June 2009. So we sued you just in time. Well, maybe your credit report shows the last payment you made was January 2009. So that can be some very useful evidence because National Collegiate or AES or NCO or whoever they're using this week is telling the world your last payment was January 2009, but then National Collegiate comes in and conveniently says, no, 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 it's June 2009. And it's amazing. Sometimes they're, all their records consists of, in some of these situations, is they say, well, that's what we put on our computer. We go, well, give us the check. Oh, no, your guy paid in cash, John. Really? We paid in cash. That's how convenient. So the credit reports can be helpful. It's not often that they will prove critical in a collection case, but you know what? I put my seatbelt on every time. I'm not expecting every time to be in a car wreck. 
it's worth the very little effort it takes to pull these. So how do you pull them? Well, if you haven't done this in the last 12 months, the easiest way is you go to annualcreditreport.com. That's the official site. You can get your credit reports for free. You don't put in your credit card. There's no monitoring service. You just legitimately get your credit reports for free. And so that's how I would suggest getting them. All right, this is a, a related question to what we had a little bit ago, but isn't it illegal for collection lawyers to sue me on an old debt in Alabama? The answer is no, not in, in and of itself. It's not illegal. Now, if they're suing you on a debt that the statute of limitations has run and the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act applies, then yes, that will be legal, or at least it likely is illegal. Uh, if they're suing you on a debt that you do not owe, then that's illegal. But just sort of in and of itself, is it wrong for a collection lawyer to sue me on an old debt? No. That's what they do. That's what the law is set up for. You can file lawsuits. All right. Here's one that the first time I heard it, I thought, that's really a strange question and uh, I'll never get that again. Then I kept getting it. So you may not have this question, or you may, but in any event, I want to answer it. How do I know the collection lawyers have truly bought the debt they're suing me on? Well, the answer is that almost never <laughs> do they own the debt that they're suing you on. The collection lawyers, so take Nathan and Nathan, they are collection lawyers. They don't buy debt. So you have to look at who the plaintiff is in the case, because that's the company that is claiming to own your debt. That's the company that's suing you. It's not the lawyers. Now, if for some reason you have some information that uh, the collection lawyers are claiming to own the debt, well, then you need to ask them about that or talk to an Alabama attorney about that. Uh, occasionally we see that in the credit card world where these collection firms in Alabama will set up uh, a little separate corporation to buy the debt and then they sort of represent themselves and it's it's kind of a strange thing I've seen it in court you know where the lawyer is the witness and the lawyer it's it's just bizarre but I've never seen that in the student loan context so um, hope that answers that question. All right, so what does the FDCPA have to do with debt collection case? Well, if the uh, National Collegiate Student Loan Trust is a debt collector, then it's subject to the rules of the FDCPA. The collection lawyers are almost always subject to the FDCPA. And what the FDCPA prohibits is lying, any type of misrepresentation, any type of deceptive conduct. It also controls what is fair and unfair in a collection case. So for example, you have to be sued in a certain county, uh, which may be different than the rules for where you can be sued in Alabama under Alabama law. And so it just lays on a layer of protection for you and deals with your credit reports, deals with phone calls you may get. So it's a very powerful law. Uh, we just have to see if it applies in your particular case. Now, what's discovery? I, I've mentioned this briefly as I think we we're going through some of the options. But discovery is where one side in a lawsuit can request information from another side in the lawsuit. So here a National Collegiate can request of you documents and information. So the documents are called requests for production. So I may say, give me all the documents you have related to this loan. Give me information about your bank accounts. Give me this. Give me that. Whether that's appropriate or not, it's a different matter. Then they can send you questions to get information from you. Those are called interrogatories, kind of think of an interrogation. And so they can ask you all these questions. They can also send you what are called requests for admissions. That's where they say admit or deny the following. So admit that you haven't made a payment on your student loan since whatever date. Or admit that you uh, signed the loan that's attached as Exhibit A whatever it may be. 
and you have certain time limits to answer those questions. Normally, not always, but normally 30 days from when they were served on you. And if you don't answer them, then there's some bad consequences. There is also something called a deposition, and that's where the lawyer asks you questions under oath in person. And there's a court reporter there taking everything down. And if you have a lawyer, your lawyer will be there at the deposition to object if there's something that's asked that's inappropriate. But that's what discovery is. And you can do discovery to National Collegiate on your own as long as you follow the rules or through your lawyer. So summary judgment motion, we spoke about this briefly. This is where they ask the court to end the case in their favor. And you have to respond to it. There are deadlines to respond to it. There's a certain form that you have to use. And by that, I mean, if you uh, disagree with the facts, you need to put your own facts in. And you need to make sure you have evidence supporting those facts. Uh, that could be affidavits. It could be other admissible type evidence. Uh, again, there are deadlines. When is your response due? Some people will see a summary judgment file. Then the court will say, this is set for hearing. And they go, okay, well, I'm going to show up and argue my case because I read on the Internet that's what you can do. Well, you may can do that other places, but in Alabama, the rule is you've got to respond within a certain time period. And if you don't respond in that time period, then normally the judge is not going to be interested in what you have to say because you didn't follow the rules. You know, it's like in a football game, uh, you know, saying, well, I want 15 players on the field. Well, you don't get to do that. You have to follow the rules. Well, I know I caught the ball and I was out of bounds, but you should still count it. No, we normally don't count that. So... Uh, you know, we have rules of the road. You know, you stop at a stop sign. You don't go on a red. You follow the speed limit. You have to follow the rules in court. And so this is a very dangerous moment when you're facing summary judgment. So if you're doing this on your own, make sure that you're prepared to do this. All right, so here's a question. If I hire you, so somebody says, hey, John, if I hire you, and the case doesn't settle, goes to trial, do I need to be at the courthouse? Well, it depends. It depends on if you've been subpoenaed, then you definitely have to be there. If you've not been subpoenaed, then that's going to be a discussion that you and I have about whether it's to our advantage for you to be there or not be there. And that's what the other side will do. You know, will the other side have a witness at trial? Well, they're going to decide, is it to their advantage or not? To bring in a witness and if they don't bring a witness it's because they don't think that they that it will help them now sometimes they'll say oh no 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 we we want to bring a witness we just we file so many of these lawsuits around the nation we can't keep track of them and we can't find somebody to get here well you know it's not my fault that you file so many lawsuits you can't keep up with them if you file a lawsuit in Alabama, when it comes time for trial, at least the judges I know expect both sides to be ready. Now, if I represent you, so we're the defendant, and I don't bring you to trial, well, then anything I'm trying to prove, I've got to prove through the other side, or we've already proven it. And that sometimes is our strategy. Sometimes we want you to be there because we want you to testify. Same thing for National Collegiate. If they don't bring a witness and it's at trial, then they need to have already proved it or have evidence they can get in, or maybe they want to prove it through you or through some other witness. But everybody's got to make that choice. And I can't tell you, Again, without knowing your specific facts, whether I would want you to be at the courthouse or not. Now, if you handle a case on your own, you've got to be there. If you're not there, normally that'll be a default judgment. All right, so what happens at the trial? Well, the plaintiff, National Collegiate, will, uh, they're the plaintiff. They bear what's called the burden of proof. They have to prove their case. And they will uh, put on witnesses, put on evidence, or at least attempt to that will show the court 
if it's a judge making the decision, or a jury, if it's a jury trial, but they will show uh, exactly what they need to prove. At least that's what they're supposed to do. So if they need to prove that you took out a contract, you didn't pay the contract, and they now own the debt, well, then that's what they need to prove. And if they fail to prove part of their case, then that's going to have bad consequences for them. And then once they're done, then it's your turn to prove your case. Now, when they put a witness up, you or your lawyer have the right to cross-examine that witness. When you put a witness up, they have the right to cross-examine that witness. And there are objections and there are legal arguments that are made all through the case. But that's basically what happens at the trial. And then if it's a judge, the judge may or may not say, I want you to summarize your case what's called closing argument. Uh, sometimes they'll let you do an opening statement. Other times they say, nope, let's just get right into the evidence and I'll make a decision. And then ultimately you'll get a decision. Maybe that day, if it's a jury trial, it'll be, it might not be that day, but the jury won't leave ultimately without giving you a decision. If it's a trial in front of a judge, it might be that day, it might be next week, next month, next year. So that's a very quick overview, I hope, of trial. All right, so I think I've already answered this question you know, about going to trial. Now let's add a little bit to it. What if I win my case at trial? Well, if you win your case, then the other side has an opportunity to appeal. But let's assume none of that's successful or they go, you know, we're not going to be successful on appeal, so we're not even going to try it. Well, if you win it, that normally means that you do not owe the debt that National Collegiate has sued you on. At least you don't owe it to National Collegiate, and they're the ones that claim to own it. So uh, let's kind of make this practical. So we've got somebody uh, tried the case, won the case. Now what if National Collegiate sues again on the same debt? Well, that's going to be just terrible consequences for National Collegiate if they do that. Well, what if National Collegiate or one of its little cronies, this AES, NCO, whoever it may be, what if they're credit reporting? Well, now that's a problem because a judge said you do not owe that debt, but yet they're credit reporting on it. That's a big problem for them. What if they start calling you to collect on it? Well, you, you're not supposed to collect on a debt that's not owed. So again, that's a problem. All right, so what if, what if I lose? Or what if I win? Tell me about appeal. If you're in district court, which is very rare, it's possible. If you're in district court, both sides or whoever loses can appeal to circuit court. And then it starts all over. But if you've been sued in circuit court, which is the normal thing, then to appeal it, you're looking at appealing to one of our appellate courts, either the um, Court of Appeals or Civil Appeals or the Supreme Court of Alabama. And it depends on how much money is involved and, and it, it could always be transferred between those two courts anyway. Uh, and in that type of appeal, you are writing what are called legal briefs and you're arguing why the judge did something wrong. Okay, I'll just tell you, most of these cases, nobody appeals in them. So generally, whatever the result is, people live with that. But both sides do have the option, if they lose, to appeal the case. All right, so this is the credit reporting. You know, what, why do I have to, why does the credit reporting have to be deleted if I win the case? Well, Again, I'm, this is not true in every single situation, but normally if you win, it means you do not owe the debt to National Collegiate. But yet, National Collegiate has some servicer, collector, whoever out there credit reporting on you. Well, if you win the case and do not owe the debt, how can they be telling the world that you do owe the debt? That's false credit reporting. If the company doing that's a debt collector then they violated the FDCPA. Even if they're not a debt collector, there's a very powerful law called the FCRA, Fair Credit Reporting Act, and you know, we'll be happy to help you dispute that through the proper channels 
and it either gets fixed or we look at suing whoever's at fault, suing them in federal court, and then we're asking for money damages against them. It's a very powerful law. So if you win your case, whether on your own or through an attorney, then there should not be credit reporting uh, by National Collegiate, AES, NCO, or whoever they have out there credit reporting on you. So let's talk about these companies. So here's the very simple version that's not 100% accurate, but it's accurate enough. National Collegiate Student Loan Trust claims to own your debt. AES tends to be the company that's called a servicer. So kind of like your mortgage, you have a servicer. So I just bought a house, uh, got the loan through Renaissance Bank. I think it just got transferred to Sinlar. Well, the ownership didn't get transferred. I mean, I haven't seen the paperwork. I just was told this today. But the servicing rights, in other words, who's going to send me my statement? Who's going to take my money? Who's going to make sure my insurance is paid? That type of thing. That is the servicer. That's what AES does. Uh, they you know, collect the money. They send out the statements. You can go to, the, what's our website? I think it's aessuccess.com or .org, something like that. Well, NCO is the collection agency. They also tend to be the company that claims to keep all the documents for the trust because apparently there's no employee at the trust. Okay, So when you start seeing affidavits, you'll see somebody and they go, you know, I am a litigation support specialist or whatever their title is this week at NCO. And we are the custodian of the documents for the National Collegiate Student Loan Trust 2008-12, you know, whatever it is. And so there really is this, you know, I, I think it's the right word, this incestuous relationship between these companies. And they, they kind of have a bit of a problem with, you know, you say, well, what's your relationship? And they go, well, tell me why you're asking, and then I'll tell you. It's like, well, no, there ought to be a clear relationship. But in my opinion, they kind of shaded a little bit on, well, what's going to be helpful to me? Uh, that tell me the question, then I'll decide what the answer is. So just understand it's kind of a circular relationship. National Collegiate, AES, NCO, there are other people involved that we're not getting into because it gets pretty complicated, but these are the ones that you would probably see in a lawsuit. So can you sue these companies? Well, it depends. Do they violate federal law, Fair Credit Reporting Act, Fair Debt Collection Practices Act? Do they violate state law? Maybe it's malicious prosecution, maybe it's invasion of privacy, whatever it may be. Uh, you just have to sit down with an attorney and find out, here's what happened, here are my options. Do any of those options include suing National Collegiate, AES, NCO, or some other player in this matter? Well, here's the final question. What do I do now? Well, first, you know, congratulations because you watched this very long video. And I assume that you have watched this because you have been sued and you're very interested in getting an understanding of what's going on so that you can make the right decision for you and your family. So what should you do now? Well, again, I don't know which option you should pick. But my suggestion is that you evaluate, okay, when was I sued? When was I served? That's really the critical quote. When did I get served on this? And I've either got 14 days in district court or 30 days in circuit court. So do I still have time? Make sure you get an answer filed either on your own or through a lawyer. My suggestion is sit down with a lawyer in Alabama and find out your options. Uh, this is not the time to call your second cousin four times removed who used to be a lawyer in Nevada. Okay, Completely different rules out there. You need somebody that's licensed in Alabama, that understands Alabama law. And then ask some questions. You know, and, and it might be important to know what experience they have in this area of the law. Uh, 
What have been some of the results that they've received? So those are all legitimate questions when we're dealing with these debt collection lawsuits. And there are just almost countless debt collection lawsuits. Uh, there's a couple of companies, they each file about 100 lawsuits a week in Alabama. Now, National Collegiate's not that many, but it does file a bunch of lawsuits. Um, there's also a lot of similarities with what's happened over the years, particularly when the economy crashed in about 08 with the foreclosure and mortgage world and National Collegiate. So, you know, you may ask an attorney, do they understand about what's called securitization, which is just the way modern financing tends to work in these private student loans and in mortgages. Do they understand about the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act? Uh, do they ever go in a courtroom? Things like that. So I'd sit down with an attorney, make a list of any questions you have. Make sure you get those questions answered. Make sure you're comfortable with that attorney. You're comfortable with the fee if you're hiring the attorney. And then make your decision on, are you going to file bankruptcy? Are you going to fight it on your own, settle it on your own, hire a lawyer to fight it, or hire a lawyer to settle it? So. I do want to congratulate you because you are showing that you're somebody that will take action. Uh, a lot of people won't do that. Like, oh, I don't have time to watch this video. Oh, I don't have time to talk to a lawyer. Oh, I don't have time to do any of this. I'm just going to pretend this will go away. Well, that's usually not a very successful strategy. So I do want to congratulate you because you've taken action and you're showing yourself that you're somebody who is a person of action. You are somebody that's willing to do something, not just talk about it, but do something. And so now's the time to do something. Uh, if you want more information about these lawsuits, you can always go to our main consumer websites at alabamaconsumer.com. You can also call us 205-879-2447. Uh, normally you'll speak with Carolyn. You can ask for her and she can talk to you, uh, find out when you were served, pull up information on the online court system, and then she'll set up an appointment. She has authority and control over my calendar to just go ahead and set up the appointment right then, and then we'll talk, and we'll go over your options. So again, thank you for watching this. Uh, I want to congratulate you, and I hope that you are proud of yourself for watching this entire video, for being somebody who's taking this very seriously, and if we can be of any help to you, feel free to reach out to us either through our website, alabamaconsumer.com, or by just simply picking up the phone and calling us at 205-879-2447. All right, well, thank you very much, and I will look forward to speaking with you. Bye-bye.